for the first seminar of this new academic year at the Central Asia program at GW, entirely online, of course. But we are very happy to have, begin with a book launch uh, uh, on a very uh, important and timely topic, and that we will be we will be discussing that in, in a few minutes. So I would like to welcome our speaker, our discussant, and all the people attending uh, the event. As usually, for those of you who have been attending several of our events, I will. Uh, ask you to I will moderate the discussion and ask you to ask your question in the chat or in the Q and A box, and then I will moderate uh, the discussion once our uh, um, author and discussant and myself have uh, uh, make some uh, short presentation. So today we are really happy to welcome Luca Anchesti, who is a senior lecturer in Central Asian Studies at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, and who has been just publishing a really uh, kind of seminal work. Analyzing Kazakhstan foreign policy, regime neo eurasianism in the Nazarbayev era. And previously, uh, Luca has also published uh, uh, the, the classical reference on Turkmenistan uh, uh, foreign policy and the, the perpetual neutrality uh, uh, concept. So, Luca, congratulations for this new book. It's really a lot, I know <laughs> it was a lot of work and several years of, of uh, research in not an always easy context. You mentioned that, by the way, in the book. And I'm happy to welcome also as a discussant Nargis Kasenova, senior fellows at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University and associate professor at uh, Kimep University in Almaty. So welcome both, Luca. I would like to give you the floor first to make a short presentation of the book, and then I will give the floor to Nargis for uh, some comments, and I will myself add also some short comments on, on this really great book. So Luca, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much, Marlene. This is the book. I, I got a copy just two weeks ago because of COVID, so I'm very happy to show it to everyone connected from all over the world. And I am very grateful to both you and Nargis, Marlene, to uh, organize this event, but also I want to acknowledge your scholarship, which, as I mentioned in the acknowledgement, I had a constant exchange with you two while researching the book, and it's been fantastic, you know, like building on your work to address this issue, which, as you mentioned, is not the easiest one to go to, mostly because, you know, it refers to a foreign policy context, which it's not, uh, it's not really transparent at the best of time, and it becomes really oblique when the the authoritarianism will become more uh, hardened. So, I'm going to have an, init an initial uh, discussion here, uh, presenting what I reckon are the most important findings of the book. And I'm going to refer to two of findings, one which I could see shaping up while uh, doing the research, some sort of anticipated findings, and one which really I wasn't expecting at all to have, but I only realized it was going to emerge while doing the research. So in that sense, this is also a kind of um, description of my research journey, which has been quite long because I have been engaged with this issue for a few for a few uh, for a few years actually. And uh, what's uh, I think before going to the findings, I think that there are two main myths of Kazakhstan foreign policy that this book intends to dispel. The, the myth of multivectorism and the myth of regionalism. I'm going to quickly speak about these two before going to the main findings. So, uh, the, one of the things that the book does is questioning any account of Kazakhstan foreign policy, which simply equates that foreign policy to multivectorism. And here I go back to many discussion here with Nargis in the, in the past, that Actually, Kazakhstan in multivectorism is dead, was dead at least 20 years ago. So, uh, we recently had an article appearing on International Affairs talking about Kazakhstan in multivectorism. And uh, the argument that my book brings forward is that the kind of multilateralism which we've seen developing in the new Eurasian context in Kazakhstan is never multivectoral. If by multivectoral we interpret, we, we mean a kind of direction foreign policy which is followed by actions. And the book makes a case for the disappearance of Central Asia from Kazakhstan foreign policy in the mid 2000s and uh, other writing which have done on the Kazakhstan Gulf relations, Kazakhstan EU relationship, in turn determine how those frameworks 
lose relevance. The book has some kind of quick reference to OSCE, and the OSCE disappears straight after the, the chairmanship for the Horizon Kazakhstan foreign policy. So in that sense, and this is one of the main contributions of the book, I, I think, what we've seen is a kind of Eurasianism that is focused on a specific range of countries, which are usually located in the post-Soviet world. So the reduction of Eurasia to, to post-Soviet Eurasia actually determines the end of the death of multilateralism, the multivectorism. The second myth which this book intends to dispel, which is something which the Kazakhstani propaganda does all the time, is equating Kazakhstan to the bigger integrator in Central Asia. There is a whole chapter of the book, chapter three, that really goes into Central Asia regionalism from the beginning of the post-Soviet era to the 2005, which, when Uzbekistan joined Evrazes and the whole regional institution collapsed. And what we see is that Kazakhstan acts as the biggest disintegrator. So when Azerbaijan is on the one hand portrayed as the man who's going to bring together Central Asia by its own propaganda, the reality is that Kazakhstani foreign policy moves a parallel layers of which Central Asia is but one. And in that sense, uh, the fact that Central Asia does not allow the Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan to achieve economic benefits with integration, the fact that there are not many image poor image making point to be scored by being integrated with, with Central Asia only, relegates the regionalism at the very margin, bring it to disappear. And the book goes into the whole discussion about what the Kazakh Yeli uh, narratives of Kazakhstan say, we are, with Nazarbayev saying we don't have to be uh, a stand with something else, which is really taking Kazakhstan out of Central Asia in, the, in a very similar way to that it was done during the Soviet time, in which Central Asia and Kazakhstan were parts of two, two separate regions within the Soviet Union. So this is interesting. In 93, the, the, the regions, the, the, the Central Asian states talk about being called Central Nairadia, so being one, and then Kazakhstan, with the Kazakh, what the Kazakh narrative pretty much gets out of the fold. So these are the two myths which the, the book really uh, questions, but it does too, by reading to the line, there is no, it, this is, this is uh, it's a study of intergovernmentalism, inter which this is what the, the book really does. And the, the two main findings that I'd like to bring to your attention uh, to people at home is uh, are one which I, I could see because as, as, as it's mentioned before, Marlene, I have been working on other Central Asian foreign policy framework. And it's the fact that regime Eurasian, new Eurasianism is an essentially personalist foreign policy. So the fulcrum of the, the, the foreign policy is President Nazarbayev. Um, because not only is seen as the, uh, the person who uh, carries out the, opera, the implementation of the policy, so the policy actor, but the propaganda, of which I read a lot, actually makes him the person who thought about the policy. So he's it's, it's, it's portrayed as a Eurasianist, neo Eurasianist thinker, if you want. Uh, and there is a whole series of Nazarbayev works which I do quote during the, during the, in, in the book. But, and of course, most of, of them will be kind of ghost written. But the, the, the idea that we know is that Nazarbayev is a prominent Eurasianist thinker. And the, the culmination of this. Uh, union between the Tinka and the policy operator is the Moscow speech in 1994, which is the speech in which Nazarbayev talks about the, the imperative of re-establishing a Eurasian Union of equally sovereign states. Uh, the, the, the glorification of the different roles, though, of when it comes to Nazarbayev, actually reveals throughout the, the 30 years, which I examined, almost a year which I examined in the book, reveals that the capacity of Nazarbayev and of Kazakhstan to carry out a coherently Eurasianist policy actually declines with the withering of Kazakhstani authoritarianism. So 
the last 10 years have been Nazarbayev long goodbye. And what we've seen is Kazakhstan being less and less able to carry out a consistent uh, Eurasian foreign policy. And uh, at the end of the story, we've seen Kazakhstan involved in a Eurasian, but not Eurasianist union, in which uh, is pretty much uh, an authoritarian club, club, with some exception, of course. There are not many economic benefits. And the real issue of determining who's in charge between Kazakhstan and Russia is critical to that kind of association. It's critical, at least for where Kazakhstan stands. Then, of course, the, the power differential is different. So, which is very much something similar to what happened in, 90, in 1994. So, in this context, the personalization of policy and the withering of, of Nazarbayev policy uh, impetus, if you want, establish as a Eurasian, a Eurasianist uh, policy, which is not intellectual. It lost all the kind of uh, intellectual endeavor of the early 90s, where it is about globalization, it's about the civilization struggle, and also it's not technological. So it does not keep pace with the development of Eurasia. In that sense, it leaves connectivity to the margins of it, which is a point with, that I make in the, in, the, in, the, in the final empirical chapter, the one that looks at the Eurasian Union, in which I really show that uh, whatever happens around Eurasia in terms of wealth and world development, or in terms of other kind of rise of connectivity, doesn't really uh, impact what the, the transportation needs are within the Union, which is a, a missed opportunity for the, the Kazakhstan economy. And then just to move to the final point, which is the, the finding which for me, was surprising is that to all intent and purposes, Kazakhstan and Eurasianism is an exercise in geopolitical dissimulation. So, and I'm going to explain myself here. So, at no point, if any of you read Kazakhstani official documents of foreign policy, we have a comprehensive, a clear, and unequivocal description of what Eurasia really is. This is not only happening in the official foreign policy, but also in the implementation of Eurasianist policy in different policy frameworks. So it's, it's, really, it's really opaque. Uh, at the beginning, we wanted to involve all of the Soviet states. Then with OSCE, Eurasia is between Lisbon and Vladivostok, as we always say. Then it becomes reduced to the, to the customs union, which is but there is never a conclusive definition of what Eurasia is for Kazakhstan. So the special representation of these policy frameworks, it's unclear. What I conclude though, which I think is the book most interesting bit list for me, is that every time that Kazakhstan is committed to some kind of integration, be it in the post-Soviet integration with the Central Asia or even with China, with the you know, integratia, integratia, the Nazarbayev is talking about so integration of integration, the government has to refer to Eurasia as something else. So Eurasia becomes a sort of a mythical uh, dimension in which you trade better, it's more secure, it's more open than the actual integration that you're pursuing in that specific way. So it becomes an instrument of dissimulation, a de-peripheralized de Kazakhstan from whatever integration movement we're talking about. And this is the kind of uh, rhetorical design which I think has worked really well. Because all of us, I mean, those, or those of us who are experts or those who are interested, or even the, the, the people who got a bit of an idea of international politics, when you mention Kazakhstan, the first thing they say to you, well, there's an Eurasian state. So it has worked in place. But what is Critically important to me is that the government never defined what Eurasia is, yet put Nazarbayev as the center of Eurasia, Astana as the center of Eurasia and of Eurasianism, which is a very clever, if you want, rhetorical point in which you make your own regime at the center of uh, undefined, unclear, yet very important because, you know, Eurasia is a catchy name uh, when it comes to define the position of your state in the world. And this is, if you want, the way in which uh, that kind of foreign policy uh, complements the regime maintenance dimension of that. 
obviously it brought a lot of currency, a lot of relevance to um, to the to the regime in, in Astana, but then it didn't really bring any real policy benefits. So this is a little bit of the, the critical points of the book, but I'll be happy, of course, to answer more questions and respond to your observation. Thank you so much, Luca, for this great presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to Nargis for some of her comments. Nargis. Thank you very much. Um, well, Luca, congratulations on the book. I fully agree with Marlene. I think it's it's destined to become a reference book, and I think it's the only book at the moment that covers uh, this scope, uh, 30, 30, almost 30 years of, uh, of Kazakhstan's independence. And um, I think your choice of uh, key concepts, key organizing concepts, Eurasianism, power, uh, identity makes a lot of sense and sort of gives this very nice frame for uh, analyzing the, um, the evolution, transformation of Kazakhstan's foreign policy during these three, uh, three decades. So uh, it's a very solid book. It's a lot of research went into it. Um, it's very rich. Um, I think it puts very bold arguments and uh, I think it's thought provoking. Um, it's definitely challenged some of my thinking on, uh, on Kazakhstan's foreign policy. Um, on um, some things, maybe well, some things you convinced me. Uh, on some, um, maybe you know, I'm you know, I, I will actually try to challenge you a little bit <laughs> in, a, in a minute. Um, so, but but it's definitely uh, it's 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 an excellent book, and I'm very happy. I'm very happy it's out. So, well, I can I can continue with praise, but I think for the sake of discussion, it's better if I try to challenge uh, to challenge. Um, I, you a little bit, try to challenge you a little bit. And um, I put up some notes and then I will uh, actually move to the points that uh, that you just made. Um, so, uh, well, the, um, the first point I, I want to make is that I would probably um, pay more attention uh, to uh, the, um, the story to the beginning of Nazarbayev's Eurasianism prior to the collapse uh, to the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union. Um, we know that he played a very important role in the um, in the reformatting of relations between the center and republics, um, in the development of the Union Treaty, uh, and uh, we know about the tensions uh, that uh, the uh, this uh, this process is triggered in uh, along the Europe Asia divide in the uh, in the Soviet uh, in the Soviet space. We know about the concerns uh, in the Slavic capitals that the new union will be dominated by to be takers. You know, the, the, so basically the Central Asian uh, Central Asian republics. Uh, so there was this hierarchy um, at the time of you know European republics more forward and uh, Asian republics more backward. Um, and Kazakhstan was sort of in between, in between these two uh, two two worlds. Uh, and I think this in between position of the republic um, uh, that it found itself during this late uh, late Soviet period is is quite important for understanding understanding further development. So I, I see sort of the beginning uh, the beginning there. Um, uh, I would also. Emphasize the change of okay. If I move a little bit forward to the uh, to the nineties and mid nineties, um, uh, I would want to emphasize the change of Yeltsin government's policies um, uh, toward the CIS and the post-Soviet disintegration and integration. Um, in the that took place in the mid uh, around mid nineteen nineties, and uh, well, when we remember um, when Evgeny Primakov became prime minister of Russia. Uh, and attempted to recover uh, recover the Russian positions in the uh, in in Central Asia uh, against the back, background of the disappointment with the West. So so I so basically what I am trying to say to say here is that yes, uh, I agree with you that that we see a new stage with uh, in uh, Russia Kazakhstan relations and the development of uh, Eurasianism um, with Putin becoming coming to power, but uh, but. I think the definitely re-energized these efforts, but uh, uh, the trend sort of started earlier. So I would put the trend in mid uh, um, in mid nineties. So 
uh, and uh, we can uh, put the this first customs union effort, the first effort to create the customs union in the 1990s, kind of in this context, um, the second half of the 1990s. Um, well, I fully agree with you that there, is, there, there are big differences between uh, between Russian Eurasianism and uh, Kazakhstan's Eurasianism, or as you rightly point out, it's very personally so not survives Eurasianism, we can probably say. Uh, and I'm sure Marlene will have a lot to say to say about that, but um, and definitely the the Russian Eurasianism has a much uh, a much better intellectual pedigree. Um, but for me, the important distinction between the two is that um, in case of Russia, it's looking away from Europe. And actually, in case of Kazakhstan, that's an attempt to um, attach itself firmer to Europe. Um, and you write about the um, deep peripherization, and I think it's a great term. I'm going to use it <laughs> myself. Um, so, in this case, I would think Kazakhstan tries to make most of being the periphery of uh, of Europe, and that sort of gives our Eurasianism a different different direction, a different sense. So, Europe sort of stands for uh, modernity, for postmodernity. Of course, it's not the only embodiment of of it. Uh, Kazakhstani leadership, as we know, was fascinated by by you know uh, Singapore example and South Korea example and so on and so forth, but. Uh, but Europe is sort of the cradle of uh, modernity and uh, the original source for Kazakhstan's modernity, obviously via uh, via the Russian influence, and that's I think an important important uh, point. Um, I, I also think you um, you underplay the importance of the West, especially uh, especially the United States for for Kazakhstan. Uh, here's if I can. Um, refer to uh, to a quotation, it's on page 11, um, where you write, as a con consequence, a very substantial segment of Kazakhstan's early foreign policy was played out vis-a-vis -vis the uh, CIS, while relationship, relationships with more distant partners, and the West in particular, were assigned a relatively marginal role within the Kazakhstani external outlook. I think I would disagree with that. Um, I think the US was seen as the top Top dog in the new international order that Kazakhstan was entering as an uh, as an independent state, and uh, Nazarbayev was always very sensitive to the hierarchies, and maybe the concept of hierarchy I would kind of also uh, play up a bit, um, and he he was sort of this cosmopolitan. He saw himself not as a regional leader, you know. He he saw himself as a leader of a practically global global scale, you know, on par with. Lee Kuan Yew, Ataturk, and you know Churchill, and uh, and uh, whatnot. So, so basically, in this hierarchy, he's, he was trying to place himself as high as possible in this kind of international hierarchy, not in the Eurasian, uh, in the Eurasian space. So, um, and I think it was important for um, for Kazakhstan's leadership that the U.S. was very active in the uh, in the post-Soviet space in the 1990s, it was ready to support the newly independent, newly independent states, uh, help them um, build foundations of their sovereignty, uh, well, in general, and vis-a-vis -vis of Russia, obviously, that's, that's, very, that's very important. So that, that, that effort uh, um, was much, uh, much appreciated. So Kazakhstan-U.S. relationship was not just about denuclearization and plus, well, the energy issue, Chevron, and, and so on, it was, you know, just a pretty fu fundamental for uh, for um, for the leadership of Kazakhstan. Um, so, so basically, I would say I would argue that throughout the three decades, it's been a very complex game uh, for Kazakhstan's policymakers how to engage with Russia in a positive way, uh, sort of hug the bear so he doesn't he doesn't hurt you, um, and integrate with the rest of the world. And you write about this the integration with the rest of the world, and I think it's it's very very important, um, particularly with areas that were considered more de more developed and higher in the international uh, international hierarchy. And I think it's telling it's a telling detail um, that even the Eurasian Union idea um, that uh, well you you write a lot about it in the in the book. It was actually first announced in London. Uh, at the Chatham House event, not at home, 
i Dalmati och, um, och, och i Moscow. Så so, so kind of the international audience was, uh, was important. And I would also um, give another detail, which I think is quite telling. Um, when um, the, uh, the, the, the second customs union, when Kazakhstan was deciding to go ahead with it or not, uh, it coincided with, with also the Kazakhstan's attempts to join the, uh, the WTO. And um, there is a WikiLeaks cable uh, from February 2009 um, saying that Prime Minister Karim Asimov met with US Ambassador Richard Hoagland and told that he needed a clear sign from, uh, from Washington that Kazakhstan is welcome in the WTO. And upon receiving such a signal, he promised to stall the process of the uh, of the customs union formation. So it's sort of it's an evidence that it was a pretty pretty complex complex and let me say the word multi vector <laughs> multi vector game. So uh, I, I would uh, I think the the usual kind of uh, the usual way of using multi vectorism for like, understanding Kazakhstan's foreign policy may be too simplistic and you know in this sense I would agree with you, but I wouldn't bury it completely. So I think it still gives us. <laughs> a good frame for understanding what Kazakhstan has been trying to do in terms of balancing and integrating in different directions and position itself in this international international order. Um, so, well, um, uh, one more point, Kazakhstan's authorities made use of the country's multi-periphery <laughs> multi -periphery status and complex um, identity. And actually, it's more a question. And I was wondering what you make of the uh, Turkey country's cooperation which is also in substance Eurasian, right? So there are three properly Eurasian countries, right? It's Russia, it's Kazakhstan, and it's Turkey. Uh, so um, how would you maybe, what would you make of it and how would you compare it with the kind of Russia, Russia focused Eurasianism? Because for, for me, uh, this Russia focused Eurasianism is not, it is not the only sort of Eurasianism that, uh, that is, you know, considered uh, by, by uh, Kazakhstani policymakers, but also the expert community and, you know, um, uh, people who think about these things. So, okay, that's, uh, that's what, uh, that's the, what I had uh, after reading, after reading your uh, book. Uh, well, I already said that uh, um, I, I'm not fully, I don't fully agree with the, your kind of diagnosis of multivectorism that it's dead. So I, I would, you know, I think, that will be, you know, hurrying too much. Um, uh, regionalism, I fully agree with your with your uh, analysis. Uh, definitely, Central Asian kind of vector lost um, became much less important. But but we need to understand that it emerged in the early nineties due to the kind of uh, due to the disappointment of, of you know of this Eurasian integration that Kazakhstan was trying to do, right? So we were kicked out of the ruble zone, basically, until the last moment, as I was hoping that we will be in this, you know, in one ruble zone with uh, with Russia, but Russia basically kicked us out, uh, not keeping the promise. So it's again, kind of, okay, you need to survive. Okay, let's, let's sort of try to do it together with, uh, uh, with the neighbors. And, um, and that, that very quickly lost steam. You know, I, your analysis of regionalism, I think, it was quite spot on. Uh, but we see a bit of a revival in the last uh, in the last in the last years. Um, I fully agree that Kazakhstan's duration is very personalist. It's you know, Nazarbayev, basically Nazarbayev sort of monopolized in a way the the uh, the, the discourse, and it's quite elastic, uh, which which I don't think is a big uh, big drawback in a way because it's. Uh, there is a lot of political expediency in it, and you know, sort of your your maneuver and <laughs> you kind of ad adapt this thing. But uh, um, I will leave it to Marlene because she's an expert on <laughs> it. So um, the the fact that it's in decline, it's in decline with the uh, retirement of Nazarbayev, and also the the maybe the you know kind of decline of authoritarianism probably in in Kazakhstan, uh, but. I would expect a revival in a new form um, of Eurasianism, but let's see how, in what form and not. So, so 
definitely in the form that we have seen it so far, it's it's it is in decline. But uh, uh, but let's I, I I wouldn't discard it completely. I think it will we will see you know so it will be a phoenix <laughs> um, phoenix revived coming back to life uh, on connectivity. Um, I don't think it's at the margins. I think connectivity is quite central uh, for for Kazakhstan thinking about you know what it needs uh, what needs to do, uh, and uh, the the reason is not an easy kind of uh, uh, it's not easy to combine Eurasianism, uh, Eurasian integration, whatever with the, with the Belt and Road Initiative. But that's not uh, it's not so much the fault of Kazakhstan, I think it's more it's more due to tensions between. Uh, I don't know if tensions is the right word, but but basically what's ha what we see in a Russia China relations and Russia's level of readiness to be part of it or, or not. So so I I would kind of, but that's probably a different discussion. So okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Nagis, for your comment. Let me also give some. Uh, uh, Few comments on on this great book, and then give the floor back to Luca so he can answer some of, of our uh, comments, and then we will open the floor for questions. So, yeah, Luca, congrats! It's really it's a great book. It's a unique book for Kazakhstan. And when I was reading it, I was thinking, you know what? We even don't have the same for Russia. We don't have the work on Russia's Eurasianism as a foreign policy. So, so you did really something that that I think is really is a, is a major work. I will be commenting mostly on the, the kind of the intellectual construction and the relationship to Russia, because that's where I, I'm. That's what I know the best. And when I was reading uh, the book, I was really enjoying the way you were able to show the story of the deposition of the concept. By Kaza on how Russia was able to progressively right capture the concept. I mean, Russia produced your Eur Eurasianist ideology earlier, but the way progressively in the 2000s, Russia has been able to kind of capture and depossess uh, Kazakhstan from, from the concept, I thought was, was really good. And I think you have the really right point in saying that Kazakhstan failed to intellectualize the, its Eurasianism. And on that, of course, it's impossible for Kazakhstan to compete with Russia because Russia is able to produce so many, <laughs> so much ideological narrative and product that, that, that Kazakhstan cannot follow. But that was really interesting on how you were showing the degree of opacity of the production of narratives and the fact that compared to what we know for Russia, I mean, in Russia, we know very well who is producing ideology. We know the role of Surkov. We know who by what, who gets presidential grants, which kind of group get money, how they compete with each other. We have very less knowledge about how it works on the Kazakh side, the production of kind of ideological product. So that was really interesting to see how you were trying to get information and build on that. And I was yeah, hoping or waiting to see more Kazakh names appearing. And when you were explaining that all these Sabisiedniki around Nazarbayev were more or less like Dugin, Panarin, and then at Maitov, and I was, and of course not Suleimanov for reasons you are very well explaining, I was thinking that you still have this kind of feeling of intellectual inferiority. I mean, to have Dugin and Panarin invited to kind of give discussion, even in 2004, having Kazakhstan commissioning a book to Dugin to celebrate Nazarbayev Eurasianist mission, that's really saying a lot about this feeling of not having enough at home to be able to produce the same book or still, you know, kind of very still post-colonial impression that if it's produced by someone in Russia who has some opening in Moscow, then that would be more prestigious than if the book was produced by someone in Kazakhstan. So I think that was really uh, uh, interesting in the way you explain also the, 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 the kind of um, uh, obsession with Gumilyov and trying to name a lot of things after, after Gumilyov in the 90s is really interesting. And I would think how much in fact, and that's also something Kazakhstani Eurasianism fell at, at deconstructing is that Gumilyov obsession of ethnicity and reading ethnicity at the biological aspect is totally incompatible with the civic identity that Kazakhstan has been trying to, to, to build. And they really haven't been able to kind of discuss how you can combine that aspect of Gumilyov and the kind of civic identity uh, uh, promotion that Kazakhstan was doing. And, and the last point on this uh, uh, aspect that also I thought 
would have been great to develop a little bit more, even if I, it's not easy to do so, I'm saying that, but I have no clue myself, was that the lack of intellectual construction between Kazakh Eurasianisms and the Belt and Road Initiative. And you mentioned, you have some part where you mentioned this Bolshaya Evrasia, where Kazakhstan tried to have it connected, but it's really, it's really low level of kind of intellectual construction. Russia is also having trouble connecting this Eurasianism with the Belt and Road. But, but so that's interesting and that was making me thinking also about the role of China on how China is changing this kind of Eurasian vision of, of uh, self vision of Kazakhstan and the fact that the Kazakhstan has an abnormal low level of sinology and production of knowledge on China, which is totally crazy for the importance that China has. And of course, I mean, Sarah Yeshkin is in jail and so on. So things are uh, globally uh, uh, not good, but the production of knowledge on China could be also maybe nicely articulated with the difficulties of, of Astana or no, Sultan in producing an, a kind of intellectual construction that would be more sophisticated than what they have been uh, 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 to do. Uh, uh, last point on, on that aspect is something you mentioned that I think is very good is how Kazakhstani Eurasianism is a reproduction of Soviet internationalisms. And I thought you could have been developed on that because that's really an interesting uh, uh, aspect. And I was thinking about the assembly of the people, you know, as really a way like the friendship between people, how it was articulated. But it's mostly articulated for domestic issues, like like all the ethnic groups are living peacefully and in harmonious. But the Soviet internationalism aspect, the kind of uh, uh, forward, uh, 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 externally looking aspect of Soviet internationalism and Eurasianism would be really nice to kind of uh, 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 develop. And as points on that, also the when you have the chapter on the rise of anti-Eurasian narrative, I think one key element that we just see emerging now, which, really, which is really fascinating, is the rise of a post-colonial discourse in Kazakhstan, right? That will be challenging Eurasianism and the relationship to Russia. And I think here there are probably a lot to look at on, you know, kind of post-colonial experience of other country outside our region and how all this construction, I was thinking, you know, for example, and how in Africa, in the French speaking Africa during the, the decolonization year, they were challenging, you know, the relationship to France and at the same time wanted to keep a kind of French speaking regional unity. So you have a, probably a lot of great comparison that could be done on this kind of post-colonial vision of how you still want some level of unity and at the same time you don't want the unity to be giving power back to the colonial center, right? And that's where the, the, the kind of tensions in the construction uh, 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 are. And otherwise, so, so uh, some question for, for you maybe to, to discuss and, and to think of. I agree with Nargi. I think that the future of Eurasianism now isn't clear because, as you said, it's very personalistic, right? So once Nazarbayev is no more president, what, what does that mean? Lukashenko is in big difficulties, even if he's step president, he's a dead political symbol. So how can Eurasianism survive without <laughs> Lukashenko and, 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 and Nazarbayev? Uh, um, and, and I agree with Nargi. I think Eurasianism as a kind of post-Soviet construction, it's probably dying. But Eurasianism had the feeling that the country is in between civilization, that will continue. Because I think that the kind of obvious geop geopolitical self-narrative you can have, right? And so I was wondering how maybe for a next project, bring uh, uh, more into the story, so of course China, but also Singapore, South Korea, all this kind of South, you know, this kind of fascination of Kazakhstan for South Asia, also for Emirates, right? And that's going back to what uh, Nargis was saying on, on Turkey. I think there is really this notion that we are in between, and in between, it's not in the sense of post-Soviet space anymore, or that, as I said, that is a dying conception. It's in between the sense we can be modern in the sense technocratic, managing, uh, uh, um, you know, IT and computers and so on, but we are authoritarian, more or less, and we have some form of nationalism or like we are pr proud of what we are and we don't want to be westernized, right? So this kind of in-between ideological combination, I think that will stay. And I think that may be something you could be developing on this Kazakh elite 
you know, strategy that looking to Mongolia, to Singapore, to South Korea, to Emirates. And last point, that's something that I think is also not very developed in the in the book, but I'm not sure it's easy to do. And myself, I always think about that and I have no clue on how to do it. That is the relationship to Islam, right? Is that what is the hidden subtext of Eurasianism is that it's not about Islam, <laughs> right? It's a way to push Islam out of the discussion. And that's the case. I mean, in Russia, it's more complex because some part of Russian Eurasianism are about Islam, but in Kazakhstan, it's a way not to talk about Islam, right? So I was wondering if you could also maybe uh, discuss these elements and maybe think of them for for our next uh, uh, project. But as I said, it's really a great book, uh, Lucas. So congratulations once again, and I give you the floor back for a few minutes if you want to do some comments on on what Nargis and I said, and then we will we will. Uh, open the floor for questions. So please, uh, people in the audience, if you want to send questions in the chat or the Q&A box, and I will be after moderating the discussion. Luca, the floor is back to you. Oh, thanks. And thanks, Nakis. This is very stimulating. And of course, it's uh, it's a lot of information, which uh, it's, it, it's not missing there, but it's such a complex issue to, to unpack that you know, like you try to address one point either chronologically and then it becomes two more than and then you go back in the future and then you miss the last few years. And of course, it's also spatial. So what kind of Eurasia for corner should I focus on when I talk about this? So uh, it is, it, it, the, which, which I want to make is that, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit too drastic when it comes to multivectorism. Uh, but I, I was trying to make the issue of entropy coming up in the sense that it's not very much about being equidistant, which they actually have done it very well. So they have managed to be at the center of this big content without being too close to anyone in particular. But what I was questioning with my critique of multivectorism is the fact that I've seen many of the non um, both Soviet vectors disappearing in intensity. And of course, this it's not just because of Kazakhstan, but it's also because, and as you and you're right, Nagis, I should have put more time on the West. But my experience, because I wrote an article on Kazakhstan EU relations, was that that kind of relationship ended up quietly when Nazarbay realized that there wasn't any kind of prospect for entering the neighborhood policy. So there was the, the there wasn't an expansion possible in the way in which Kazakhstan would interact with the European Union. So in that sense, the, the, the signature, the upgrading of the PCA was the maximum they could get, and they did get that. So, but on the US, you're absolutely right, uh, which goes back to also your point about, should I focus more on the last of the Soviet time? I should have, especially, you know, it, um, because, uh, I made a point that, you know, like when I talk about the, the Almaty summit in, in the, the dying days of the Soviet Union, that it is true that the Eurasian order, the post-Soviet Eurasian order, is born in Kazakhstan, because the, that where the, the CIS declaration was signed. But I didn't really expand on that, I mean, mostly because of space, I must say, you know, like it's kind of, it, the, the chapters of the book actually are quite wordy and, you know, and I spent a lot of time being an editor, you know, I always tell the others, you should write, show the papers, and I end up with 15,000 word chapters. So it was kind of problematic for me in, in that sense. Um, uh, one thing which I uh, didn't really know about it, and I'm very grateful for your comment, Mike, is, is the Yeltsin role in all of this. Um, obviously, my perception was skewed, was flawed. Uh, I should have really looked much more into, but the thing is that I didn't really want to look into Russian documents because then I would have opened a can of worms because I, and I go back to, to Marlene's point now, is that when you, when, you, when you look at the production in terms of Eurasianism, discourses on Eurasia, early talking about Eurasia, Russia, you can't beat Russia. So you end up having the kind of uh, immense material that really you, to be analytically fair, you had to give the same relevance, and it would have been a totally different book. Uh, 
before I move to the Turkey, to the Turkey question that you and I I want to make one point which I promised I mentioned before because I had a discussion with Marlene at some point in a conference about do we have other Kazakhstani writers about Eurasianism? And obviously, this is not a book about um, popular culture, and also I don't read Kazakh, so I couldn't really go into that. But reading the, the, the large numbers of documents which I had, I identified, and, and I mentioned them in the, the conclusions of the book, three or four people which really do a lot of legwork for Nadia Flyer. And of course, they are all organic to the regime. You got Bulat Sultanov, which is a think tank, so roughly a colleague of ours, which spent a lot of time exposing the party line. And I read his, I read his Russian writing. So, uh, and then you have the, the two, the more politicized, the more internationally prominent writers, Tahir Mansurov and Mikhmar Jami Singarin, which has spent a lot of time actually talking about how that Eurasian vision, which of course always changes, never the same, actually can be implemented multilaterally within the Russian, con within the post-Soviet context. So there are a few people which have done some kind of uh, writing, but it, it, it is not too dissimilar from what you, you find Nazarbayev writing in those innumerable books on uh, and now I'll just try to put all of your issues like together now, because I think that you are right. And this, you made, the both of you made the same, po the same point in very different way. Is that, I mean, I didn't really talk about the disappearance of the Eurasianist idea. I talk about the decline. And for me, the decline, again, goes back to the issue of policy entropy, how much you are able to uh, carry out that policy visibly. And in the last 10 years, we've seen less and less bigger from the Kazakhstan issue, which transformed, I would say, the focus potentially of this Eurasian idea. And what Marlene, you call this in-betweenness of Kazakhstan, being part of something else, I think you, I agree with you, is a theme that, uh, that will be more relevant in the next few years. It, in the, in the, the last point, the very last point which I made in the book is that, uh, Eurasian is there to stay. They're not going to be a change. This policy is going to be staying as part of what I see the regime center of the, the foreign policy. So we're not going to see a non-Eurasian in Kazakhstan. But you are probably right. The next chapter will be how uh, Kazakhstan interacts with other parts of Asia. And uh, I've done work on the Gulf, which is kind of has been mentioned and. Actually, I did some writing on Kazakhstan, the Gulf relationship. And uh, to address one of your points, Marlene, Islam is not an issue. Not an issue, not because it's not important, but because the political sensitivities of the Kazakhstani regime in particular are actually uh, preventing the, the establishment of that kind. Of... So my guess is that we would see the evolution of the Eurasianism in a a secular context, not of a religion. I mean, some of the most interesting interviews I made while researching the book were about pantheism. And, you know, the spirituality there. But, and you see some, some references in, the, in documents about being tangrist. Of course, this is not as pushed to the extreme as the Turkmen's have done with neutrality. You've seen some kind of uh, more spiritual issue uh, coming up. Uh, what I am not sure is that uh, how uh, you going to, you in, in terms of Kazakhstan diplomat policymaker, how you're going to adjust what really are your image making uh, points interacting with the rest of Asia. And this goes back to your point, Nagis, about the US. Yes, you are right. Now, Zarbayev really know about the hierarchy and always wanted to be seen be friends and ally with powerful state. But this is kind of a question which you're going to ask yourself, how are you going to make this work when it comes to being in the Turkey context, the Gulf states, and the rest of non-Eurasian Asia, so, you know, Southeast Asia, South Korea, or, or whatever it is. That's a big question mark. It's a big question mark, but it's a question, it's a point, and go back to your point, Marlene, that really raises the issue of post-coloniality. I haven't really thought about this issue while doing the early research work for the book, it became more and more 
prominent when it came to um, the, la the last couple of years of work. Uh, because the way in which I saw this specific Eurasian strength was always trying to, to carry out a poor reinterpretation of what the linkages between center and periphery are. And it, was, it wasn't, and, and I actually use this kind of three issues, leadership, sovereignty, and integration. Uh, to me, these are the, tri the, 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 the triangular relationship which determine how you uh, establish the post-coloniality of this Eurasianism. And it very much becomes a Shakaspectan affair in the end. And I think that this kind of, um, if you want, intellectual concern really consumed my analysis. And actually, it, it made me lose the importance of the West that you mentioned or before uh, Narki. So, but for me, it was very important, especially because this became very visible after 2015, when you know you have this new Eurasian Union, which finally got uh, well, or became operational. And then you see Nazarbayev being, you know, like even visually between these younger men between this more, you know, Putin and Lukashenko. So it's kind of, to me, incarnated the, the, the decline of the, of the idea and the transformation of the idea in something which, as Marlene noticed, became very much Russia-driven. Not just no longer in, intellectually, because that was always the case, but also on a political point of view, which is what Nazarbayev had tried to rediscuss from Chatham House to Moscow, to, to all the kind of speeches he made about that. Uh, one thing which I am not clear, and I, I'm going to with you, I really haven't thought about, it, is the issue of China in all of this. Uh, I haven't talked about it uh, mostly because uh, while discussing, while you know, thinking about the book, I've tried to stay away from bilateral relations, which is the only reason why I didn't really look at the US. Uh, but also because, mm, I have a particular view of this one belt, one road that is kind of, it operates in this murky area between state and non-state. So it's kind of, it was difficult to, for me to place it, uh, not, not spatially, but actually in terms of tiers of government in the discourse. Because to me, the book, and that's why it's called regime authoritarianism, is about the Kazakhstan, about how foreign policy, the role of Kazakhstan in Eurasia, what is Eurasia is perceived by the group around Nazarbayev. So, to be completely honest with you, too, and I thank you for that, I really haven't thought about the role of China. I mentioned China in chapter five when I talk about how this Eurasian Union is developing, and I agree with you that it's not Kazakhstan's fault, it's the circumstances. But my point is that the circumstances are created by the fact that Nazarbayev has lost his policy vigor. You see what I mean? He found himself in this Putin led. Uh, context. So I had to look at China and uh, I mean, I guess that this is the, this is the big point of, of the future. How you have this kind of, I mean, what is the role after 30 years, next year, the 30 years of the Soviet Union, how does the, the big post-Soviet Eurasia bloc relate with the rest of Asia? That's something very, very critical, I think. Uh, not just with the, the, the Gulf, which is continue to be magical from where I am, but also with the kind of more Eastern part of, of Asia. I mean, beyond this is beyond Mongolia, really, because Mongolia was part of the Kazakh issue, but then they told Nazarbayev, well, you know, they got elections, so suddenly got disappeared from the rhetoric. So it is kind of interesting. So, I mean, it, I hope this is the book can generate some discussions about this kind of non-post-Soviet Eurasia, but uh, I also don't see that much production in terms of official documents from the Kazakhstan government. So maybe it's a question that they itself have been asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great comment, uh, Luca. Thank you so much. So I'm looking at all the questions arriving in the Q&A in the chat box. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of questions that overlap with each other about the change of the regional situation with the, the death of Karimov and Uzbekistan now becoming a more kind of region, regional integration friendly country. And so there are several questions about what is your perception on how the change of foreign policy in Uzbekistan 
could impact Kazakhstani Eurasianism? Could it kind of dilute, dilute uh, uh, Kazakhstani Eurasianism? Could it kind of force it to be reshaped? There is also a comment that I think is interesting uh, for, for you to address. What about if the, the Central Asian regionalism was also a myth, right? That maybe you would have no, no interest to be really uh, 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 developed or obtained. So if you could just begin by discussing, uh, giving us your, your perspective on this kind of Central Asian uh, uh, regional integration change linked to Uzbekistan and how it's impacting Kazakhstan, that would be great. And then I will move to the other questions. Yes, I mean, I actually, address this question in the book. Uh, so the, the, the chapter three was a chapter about uh, how the evolution of regionalism in Central Asia occurred after the, the, the Eurasianism appeared. Mm, I spent a bit of time discussing Kazakhs. Actually, this is the only bilateral framework I look at, Kazakhstan Uzbekistan relationship, which is because it's very important. I mean, as an European development of a region of actually works when the biggest economies of the region interact with, with each other. Is what we learned in Europe. And we've seen in Central Asia that they never interact with each other. There is no capital invested in the Kazakh economy, Uzbek economy, and the, the, these two states don't really trade with each other. So I try to explain how that uh, really happened during the Karimov, the Karimov times. Uh, when Mirziyoyev uh, came to the party in 2016, uh, in the book, I, I don't spend that much time because the overlap between Mirziyoyev and Nazarbayev is kind of limited. They only had two years, pretty much, in which in which they were both part of um, uh, of the Central Asian leadership, if you want. Uh, but my uh, opinion, my my, um, I mean, I wrote about this that I regard Mirziyoyev foreign policy as generally very positive because he did reopen a lot of linkages that were. Um, they were artificially cut during the, the Karim of the, the Karim of the days, but also it's kind of we 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 seen this president. Of course, this is a state that borders with all the four. So it's the real fulcrum of Central Asia. So if there is one state which can generate uh, some kind of enthusiasm about re regionalize the region, and then we, should, we also we share discussion about a region that. One day is integrated and one day, no, we're not together. This is something very fascinating, I think, about regionalism in, in Central Asia. But I, I think that uh, with the changing of that kind of relationship, uh, we could see a return of regional in the context of Kazakhstan and Eurasianism. So there could be a return of, of Central Asia, but mostly because the environment in which Toka may be operating has drastically changed from what we had before. Of course, the exception took many some, but, but, but that's, that, that's an, another one. So uh, again, the, the, the jury is out there. So I think that we've seen Mirziyoyev being kind of happening, operating pretty much by himself now. But I haven't really looked into the, the Tokayev uh, contribution to, to the region. It's certainly important that now you have a couple of forums in which these leaders can talk by themselves. Uh, but it's not to prove my point, but it's because I continue to maintain that Kazakhstan has been the biggest disintegrator, even though I agree with the comments that Central Asia as a region was a myth. It was overemphasized because, of course, it was easier to explain that part of Asia by saying, well, these states are very much the same, they should be part of they should be a region. But I think that if there is a return to regionalism, it won't be because of Kazakhstan, but it would be from Uzbekistan. So to some extent, it confirms my point. Mm -hmm. Great point. We, we also have a question about your really interesting point that the Eurasian Union, the Eurasian Economic Union is not Eurasianist. And so we have a question asking you to kind of develop how what can be Eurasian without being Eurasianist. And also to come back between integration and multivectoralism, so kind of conceptual uh, uh, points. So both Eurasia, Eurasianism, and uh, integration and multivectoralism, or integrator and multivector. Yeah, well, the, you, you've done some writing on this as well, Marlene. It is not a, a Eurasianist organization, but by any way. The, 
Mm, the, the reference to Eurasia is it's only geographical because they, they don't know how to call it. They can't call it post-Soviet Union, so they call it something they call it in that sense. Uh, the, the problem is that if you if you read as the book does, Kazakhstani propaganda on the integration of Eurasia, there is a strong component of neo-Eurasianist thinking there. And this kind of thinking has completely disappeared but in this organization, which has become a merely pragmatic point of, uh, if you want. I mean, I'm not even that negative about what they're doing because, of course, it's early days. You can't compare to the EU. The EU is 70 years been there. These guys have been only for the last 10 years. But the point is that it has become, it is up to Crimea, it has become very different from what we expected that to be. Uh, I thought that the de development of single market in the Eurasian context, you know, with the, the second custom union, as Nagis mentioned, actually made sense. Uh, I didn't really understand why Kazakhstan wanted to join the WTO because they mostly trade in resources. What's the problem? But I thought that that kind of integration was more people. Of course, when Putin, you know, push for that kind of post crimea integration, this became a more realist instrument rather than a merely economic functioning system. So that's why I think that he lost every kind of Eurasianist component. Now, Zabayev agreed to the minimum common denominator, they're just doing the basic things, energy is out of that kind of framework, which is very significant when you have Russia and Kazakhstan as economists, the very big energy producers. So it seemed to me that uh, it became, I wouldn't really say, it, but that's the only thing that came to mind. It became a glorified CIS in that sense. They do a bit more with less enthusiasm and certainly more pressure coming from the, the top. Uh, of course, the, the, the issue between integration and multivectorism, uh, again, I think that the, the, my point about multivectorism is the ability to carry it out with, the, with similar emphasis, different policy vectors attracting in the interests of different regions. And I, when it comes to the intensity of this, I, have, I really haven't seen any other region comparing with what happened with the post-Soviet uh, with the post-Soviet world, if you want. And one reason for that may be economic, because if there is one thing which Kazakhstan has not done during the Nazarbayev era is under, undergo some significant structural reform when it comes to the economy. So the trading system has not really changed in terms of what you actually trade, which is a problem when it comes to develop new uh, linkages because you're not selling new things to new partners. You have to address what your economic priorities are. And that's why I think that multivectorism as equidistance leads Multivectorism as this kind of uh, capacity to attract interest from meaningful interest, because the book really is about the difference between what they say and what they do. Declaration versus declaratory. I think that that's an important point. When it comes to effective, um, effective um, capacity to entertain meaningful relationship with different vectors. I would, I would, I'm still skeptic. And that's probably the big question for the next 20 years. That now you have the chance as an operator in, in Nur Sultan now to redirect your Eurasia to Eastern Asia, Japan, Korea. That could be a new sort of Asian multivectorism. That is actually probably possible to work because unless the, 90, the 1990s, where Diplomatic capacity was limited, state capacity was limited, and there was an economic crisis. You now have a relatively developed diplomacy, where a position in, in, in the global community is established. So, as a Kazakhstan, you are able to uh, actually open up to the new Asian multilateralism. So, this is something for someone else's book because I'm done with this. <laughs> but, in, but in any case, uh, I would say that the you could open new vectors by looking at parts of Asia which are not beyond the former Soviet Union era. Mm -hmm. Great. 
great points. We have a question that is kind of following what you were just saying about the the, the economic model also of Kazakhstan, which is that the country is particularly rich in oil, gas, and mineral, and they are more easy to exploit that in the rest of Central Asia. So could we also look at Eurasianism and the kind of disdain from Central Asia as a kind of luxury that Kazakhstan can afford as a kind of spoiled country that was able to develop its oil and gas market more easily and have uh, uh, foreign direct investment more easily than many other countries. So it's a kind of yeah, luxury attitude of the, the spoiling uh, uh, child of, of Central Asia not wanting to kind of share or be interacting with the others. What, what do you think of this kind of <laughs> reading? So I, I, I think that this is a very good point, but I think we need to move a step back. That one of the things which the book says pretty clearly is that Kazakhstani Eurasianism is non-technological uh, in the sense that you see a lot in the Russian uh, in, the, in, in the Russian discourse, you know, about these large scale projects, you, you, in Europe with Asia uh, being kind of, uh, freeways, you see a lot of that stuff in the Russian, of course, in China as well, but in the Russian, it's, it's very prominent. There's been a lot of writing about that. We don't see that in, in the Kazakhstan context. We, of course, what we hear, we hear, we are um, a bridge connecting the East and the West. We are the portal for Central Eurasia, but in practical terms, we don't really see these policies being implemented at connectivity level, okay, in, in, in real, um, in uh, in uh, real time, the paradoxical thing about the one belt one road is that they ever really decided where the road ends. We know where it starts. We know it goes to Kazakhstan, but we don't know where the road ends. That that's kind of interesting, if you want, because Kazakhstan end end up being an empty vessel for that kind of. We haven't seen the economic benefits of being that kind of in betweenness, to use your word. And uh, of course, when it comes to Central Asia. You don't have to interact with the states because you know your uh, exports needs can be satisfied with Russia, with China, or with whatever you, you want that to be. Uh, but I think that it, it is much easier to have a very good relationship with the Uzbek market, which is still 35 million people, roughly, rather than thinking about what the people in Rotterdam or in Warsaw can do with your. So, and that's something which is missing, I think. I think that we haven't really seen, in terms of commercial interest, the development, the opening up of Kazakhstan manufacture to the, the, the Central Asian context. And manufacture is not a, a secondary issue here. I mean, one of the things which I hear all the time, when I heard a lot of times in research, is the issue of cars, you know, in the, in the Eurasian Union. Like, you know, what happened to the cars? Is it going to be more expensive? Because, so, it is a critical issue. The commercial placement of a Eurasian is Kazakhstan, Eurasian Kazakhstan, in that context. So uh, I would say that yes, it is about having uh, the luxury of not caring about the stance, but this doesn't really take into consideration the fact that prices fluctuate. Oil in the last ten years, oil prices fluctuated more than before, or in to, in the more extreme terms, and that kind of, um, if you want, uh, luxury of only trading in oil and gas, well, it should have been reviewed, even because it is not going to be there forever. We are operating in a system which is hydrocarbons. In 100 years, there could be less, there could be none. So a government should really think about that. But that's, that's a complex issue. It's a complex issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Luca. We had a question about the, the role and place of the Caspian Sea in Kazakhstani kind of self con geographical construction and the fact that it seems to be really underdeveloped, like presenting Kazakhstan as a Caspian country, except I guess when we are talking about oil. But otherwise, the lack of room in the narrative about the, the, the Caspian Sea and also what it may say about Kazakhstan internal regional tension and the fact that the Western region of Kazakhstan are always a little bit kind of outside the general narrative on the, on the nation. Uh, this, is a, this is a very topical question. I mean, my view is that you see a very evident uh, 
gap in uh, uh, in capacity to operational policy when it comes to the Caspian Sea and landmass Eurasia. Or in the last few years, all we hear was that land, land you overland Eurasia, overland tra overland travel, freeways, road, right? So it's a very dynamic movement. The part of, of if it's happening in Eurasia, it's happening overland. Caspian Sea, on the other hand, if you think about it, what do you think? Oh, the Caspian not, we ever really determine whether or not is a stone, is, is a lake or, or a sea. Uh, it takes two days for a ferry to fill in Baku and get to Tokmenbashi. So there is an idea of static development there. So, which is, is a real contrast when it comes to the vitality of overland trend. And when it came to the Eurasianists, if you want, rhetoric of Kazakhstan. I didn't really encounter that much of the Caspian uh, rhetoric. I mean, maybe Narcismo knows more about that, but it seemed to be totally peripheral to the interests of the, the regime. Now, what's important about this is that it's peripheral for the central regime to the extent to which Western Kazakhstan is peripheral to the kind of Nur Sultan bubble we saw you know, how the politics really made. And you are right, uh, Marlene, you got this alternation between central Kazakhstan and peripheral Kazakhstan when it came to the uh, to, to, to the Western Oblast there. But I would be very curious to know what Nagis hears about this because I haven't really, I would have liked to have more on the Caspian Sea, but I haven't really he heard anything that places that body of water water when it comes to the um, Eurasian idea of Kazakhstan foreign policy. Nagis, would you like to add? Uh, well, uh, y yes, I, I agree. It's not really uh, part of the uh, kind of of the Eurasianist discourse, but uh, uh, but the Caspian is very important because it's a sort of an entry to uh, to Europe, to the Middle East. Uh, so um, and a good amount of resources was has been invested in opening up this kind of entry. Um, so, uh, so, so it's sort of the, the alternative route bypassing Russia, which is very important for Kazakhstan. Ah. But in terms of uh, rhetoric, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we have other uh, question also on the Eurasian Union as being, in a sense, the only room of maneuver given to Kazakhstan to try to create something that would be post-Soviet in the relationship to Russia. Like, like the room of maneuver that Russia led to Kazakhstan is quite small. And so the Eurasia, could we interpret the kind of Eurasianist mission as a way to both bargain with Russia and at the same time trying to create a space for Kazakhstan that the country could be playing on as a brand for a time, a kind of post-Soviet time when Russia would be less important or less kind of pressuring. Oh, absolutely. I think this is a this is a, an effective reading. At least I wanted the, the I can it seems to me that what we have is the the mm, and we were making before Marlene talking about how this uh, how Russia reappropriated itself of the Eurasianist discourse. It wasn't just happening rhetorically or intellectually, but also very much uh, politically. Which you know, Nagis observed that that went back to the Yeltsin era. Uh, for me, the book argues that it was very evident in the sort of second to later Putinism movement. So it seemed to me that, yes, the, the, there is uh, the progressive if you want, as, asphyxiation of what Eurasia is available to Kazakhstan. It, it, it shrinks. The, the Eurasian, uh, the possibility of integrating meaningfully across the Eurasian continent shrinks quite visibly when it comes to relationship with Russia, because Russia interprets its role in the continent in, in a more assertive way. Uh, it becomes more that, that kind of integration in that kind of uh, 
of that kind of uh, framework. And that actually uh, is important to the extent to which Kazakhstan found himself, where is it now, which is not cornered, but kind of operating in a system which, had you asked Nazarbayev 30 years ago, probably wouldn't have been very, uh, how to say, very uh, connected to his possibility of the leadership aspiration. Because it's not just about integration, it's also about leadership. The issue of who leads Eurasia, it's, it's a post-colonial reinterpretation of those linkages that existed before. So it, it, this is an important issue when it comes to, to determine um, how Kazakhstan can be uh, multilaterally operate in this integrating space of this Eurasia. Great. We, we just have like less than 10 minutes left, but there was a question that has been in fact mentioned by several people. It's not part of your book, but I guess you, you several times make some al comments, allusion to that, which is how it is received by the public opinion. And what do we know about the way the public opinion is kind of buying this Eurasian or Eurasian is destiny? Uh, uh, for Kazakhstan and how it is seen by the public opinion as very much connected to the regime or as something that is connected to the country itself. It's a tough question because what we know about the public opinion is not uh, uh, easily, it's not easy data. I mean, here you have two possible readings and I'm actually interested to know what the two of you think about it because I know you, the, the both of you have done work on that. On the one hand, you have the data of the Eurasian Development Bank. Kazakhstan is the most Euro, you know, Euro, Eurasian friendly of the EU states. Now, I didn't really see any way, any information about how those uh, surveys were conducted, but there is a bit in chapter five which presents Kazakhstan as the most enthusiastic when it comes to Eurasia. I'm skeptical about that. On the other hand, one of the trips which I made to Kazakhstan for the, for the book, for the book work, coincided with the big Almaty, what big 500 people, Almaty uh, anti-Eurasian forum. And it seemed to me that at least in that particular time when I interviewed a full Eurosceptic, uh, the regime had accepted that there could be some kind of foreign policy debate about that issue um, because of the particular historical moment, because uh, you can't repress everyone all the time. That's, that's a, a basic rule. So the people that I spoke with, that I spoke to, they were kind of anti-Eurasianism, but anti-Eurasian, you know, but I felt that they were more anti-Nazarbayev than anything else. So my point is that you have this kind of empty regime opposition, which adopts different agendas at different times. And one of these agendas that were adopted while I was researching the book was, was anti-EU. Now, not anti-Eurasianism, because I didn't know what it was, but anti-Eurasian anti integration. And I was still in the same story. This is the new Soviet Union. Who is going to call the shots? The Russians are going to invade us. So, uh, how widespread this was, I don't know, you have been doing some survey work, my lady, essentially, I know that, but I'd be really curious to know what you make of this, of this question, actually. Yeah, I can yeah. just add on that. I think it's not easy because the survey we have, so yeah, the Kazakh public opinion looks very pro-Russian on many things, right? If you, at the same time, if you look in details, they are not, they are multivectoral in the sense that they would like good relation with the three, right? With uh, Russia, US and, and uh, China. And usually it's not mutually exclusive. People who are in favor of Russia are statistically also in favor of more relationship with the US and with China, right? So what you see in terms of public opinion is those who are in favor of relationship with everybody because it looked good on the country and those who are very on a kind of isolationist 
policy, but you cannot dissociate the, the, the kind of an anti-Russian, but that would be pro-US, an anti-US that would be uh, pro-Russia. Uh, what you can identify is a kind of anti-Chinese constituency. It's usually, it's mostly visible among the, uh, uh, ethnic Kazakhs. But in fact, when we ask questions about integration, it's become difficult to really know what people think, because as you said, it's very much connected to the regime. So criticizing the Eurasian Union is criticizing Nazarbayev. Right, so you can be positive about Russia because Russia is many things. You can talk about take uh, about Pushkin, about Putin, about whatever you know. But the Eurasian Union means that, in fact, you are commenting on Nazarbayev policy, and that's much more difficult to know what people really think of. So that that's yeah, to kind of complement what what you were saying. Maybe a last question that has been asked by several people. You already mentioned it partly, but if you could develop it, that now that we are in a kind of half post Nazarbayev era, what do we know about Tokayev positioning toward Russia, toward the Eurasianism globally, toward the Eurasian Economic Union? Can we see any kind of something that would look like a Tokayevism <laughs> uh, uh, in the making, or do we look like the continuation of what was existing with the, as you said, in that case, if it's pure continuation, how can we continue a personalistic regime if the regi the person embodying it is partly living. Yeah. I mean, I think that Nike is better place for me than me to answer the question, but I'm going to make a uh, continuity rather than change is the key word to understand what's going on in Kazakhstan. We haven't really seen any kind of drastic policy change internally. We haven't, re I haven't really seen it, but maybe I've been, you know, like, the listening state is what they they, they, they they said. It seemed to me something they should have done before. So I, I didn't really see any kind of big, I mean, if I compare change, uh, leadership change in Kazakhstan, to leadership in, in Uzbekistan, I see a very big gap when it comes to the introduction of new policies. So I don't really think that there's gonna be any drastic uh, distance put between what Nazarbayev did and what Tokai is gonna be. When it comes to foreign policy, I think that uh, it is pretty much more the same. Uh, mostly because the way in which this, it, this policy allows them to do pretty much whatever they want by always referring to Eurasia, which is what we've been discussing the last 90 minutes here. So they created this very wide, this very uh, undefined geographical area at the center of which inevitably there is Kazakhstan. So it doesn't matter how big it is, it's the center of Eurasia. And that would be the area in which their policy will have to be implemented. Uh, also, uh, you have to take this kind of equidistance, you know, multilateral equidistance into account, being sort of sandwiched between two very big states, very powerful states. Russia and China is actually something which it's not an easy position to be. So why would change it? But also, I mean, Tokayev has been socialized also as a foreign minister within the Nazarbayev context. So I don't really see why change would happen. I think that Nargis may have something more relevant to say to this than you, though. Uh, no, no, I agree that there has been a lot of continuity, but I think uh, um... Now we have uh, these developments in Belarus, and and we'll, that's that's a big challenge. Uh, we don't know how how they will develop, but uh, they will definitely it's a shake up for for, for the Eurasian Economic Union for the post Soviet space. And you know if if Russia does send troops, you know to Belarus, uh, that will be quite a quite a. Um, uh, Quite a development, so and it will, you know, impact. On, I think I think Kazakhstan will need to make certain choices and uh, certain certain conclusions, but we don't know how how it will unfold. But that that's that's a you know big thing, you know, comparable to what was happening in Ukraine, Crimea, and and so on. Well, great. Well, with these comments, it's time for us to conclude that uh, discussion. So I wanted to thank Luca and congratulate him once again with this really great book that we I'm sure you will have several book launch and reviews will be also coming. It's really a, a masterpiece for us to understand better uh, Kazakhstan and the whole region. So congratulations once again. 
And thank you, Nargis, for your comments. And thank you all uh, for participating in the discussion. And please stay in touch with us. We are resuming our event, so there will be more uh, soon uh, to come on Central Asia. So once again, thank you, everybody. Stay safe <laughs> and then hope to see you once again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you again, Lika and Nargis. Thanks for the presentations. Thank you.